been pretty busy uh, couple of days, a wonderful couple of days. A lot of joyful, joy-filled things happened. Our, on Friday, our sixth graders graduated from our elementary school, and then uh, after that, our school staff then celebrated Mrs. Blair's incredible tenure here at St. John. We get to celebrate her more after this mass, but of that over 40 years as a teacher and principal uh, here at St. John. And so then we had a Friday wedding of Daniel and Rula Zielinski, it was a, a fun um, Polish slash Greek wedding reception because the bride's name was uh, Rula Michalatos. And so the, the reception had Polish music, then Greek music, then English music. I mean, and you know those, the stereotypes of my big fat Greek wedding? Some of that is actually pretty true. <laughs> so, uh, and then the following morning on Saturday, we had a day of great joy as we welcomed uh, the ordination of two uh, of our newest priests and two newest deacons. And so I barely made it back here for 3 p.m. confessions and 4.15 uh, mass. It was like 3.03 uh, when I pulled in. And then it was after 4.15 mass, back up to Westphalia, like over an hour uh, north of us. That's Father uh, Tyler Orrance's hometown. So uh, just like a wedding, there's uh, ordination has a big uh, reception and it filled the gym there. Just a lot of great joy, a lot of great music um, and celebrating that vocation. But I wanna focus really more on the vocation of marriage. We've had uh, two marriages or weddings here um, in the last two weekends. And that was fortunate for me because I didn't have very much time to prepare a homily this uh, weekend. But because um, I share this a lot at weddings, especially when they have the right readings, the Genesis readings, um, it does focus on what we celebrate today, uh, which is the Trinity and how the Trinity is the key to understanding ourselves and how God made us, because we were made in the image and likeness of God. And so this, centra, this mystery is so central to understanding uh, the rest of our Catholic faith. Without this, everything gets distorted, right? This, without this understanding of who God has made us to be. And the way we see that is by looking at God himself in whose image and likeness we were made. So that's why the, this is what the catechism says about the importance of the Trinity and how central that mystery is. Because if you ask any Catholic, you might, uh, if, they ask, if you ask them what's the most important or central mystery of our Christian faith, they might say Easter, the resurrection. Because, you know, that, we celebrate that with eight straight days of solemnity, right? The highest rank. And so liturgically, that very well might be so. It's certainly the most central mystery in the economy of salvation in our uh, dimension of space and time. But underlying all of that is the mystery of this Holy Trinity. The mystery of the Holy Trinity, it says, the Catechism, number 234, is the central mystery of Christian faith and life. It is the mystery of God in himself. It is therefore the source of all the other mysteries of faith, the light that enlightens them, it is the most fundamental and essential teaching in the hierarchy of the truths of faith, end of quote. So that's why I mention the Trinity a lot in weddings and funerals, because there's a lot of non-Catholics there. Uh, it's the fundamental DNA of our faith. And I mention that, uh, especially again with those Genesis readings, remember how the, specifically chapter one and two, uh, how God created the whole universe in those metaphorical six days, first six days. He made the sun, the moon, the stars, made the universe. And here on earth, he made all the elements, the flora, the fauna, and all the living creatures. And on that sixth metaphorical sixth day, God saves the best for last, the pinnacle of creation, which would be uniquely made in his image and likeness. He would create man. And man by himself isn't the complete image of God. It wasn't complete until he had made woman his equal. And so 
that's in this creation of, of man and woman, male and female, we see uh, a reflection of something peculiar, peculiar. Because if there's one thing about the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion, it's that God is one. There is one God, the Lord alone. And so when uh, that one God is professed as three persons, it kind of blows, blows those categories, our human categories to pieces, doesn't it? Because, but, he, but even in the first book of Genesis, it says, God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Speaks in the plural. And yet we know God is necessarily one. It's the Hebrew scriptures. And so you could dismiss it by, oh, he's talking in the royal we, you know, like, uh, like maybe the, like an office. Sometimes the Pope speaks in the royal we of we uh, because in the office of the Pope, there's been more than one person. But likewise, God, God here says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So again, nothing could be more contradictory and blasphemous, blasphemous than more than one God. If God is necessarily one, then in his very nature, in his very one being, God entails a relationship of persons, right? God is not alone even in his one being. So that tells us in the way that we were made, we're intrinsically relational. We don't make sense without others. That's even reflected in the physical structure of our bodies. We don't make sense by ourselves. And so when Adam saw himself before Eve was created, he didn't make sense by himself. That's why it's, he says, it's not, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. And from his rib, he created Eve and uh, and that's when I uh, kind of make a little joke uh, at these weddings when they choose this reading. Because he, did, he remember, God wakes Adam up from his deep sleep, shakes off the, the cobwebs, looks at Eve for the very first time, and he goes, whoa, man. You can laugh. <laughs> so that's how he gets named woman, because remember, he named all the women. So anyway. In, in fact, that was actually the gist of his reaction because it says in the scripture, Adam said ecstatically, he said, at last is one bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He's ecstatic because he's found someone who is his equal, someone worthy of his love, something that, you know, the animals, the golden retriever even wasn't worthy of. And so uh, how is this reflective then of the Trinity well, because uh, the Trinity, it starts making sense when you, have, when you see the New Testament, in light of the New Testament, where it says God is love. God is not just loving. He doesn't just do loving things. He's love itself. And so when you are love itself, you cannot be just one person. That's not love. That's narcissism. And so... That's why within love, if God is love, then within himself is a relationship of persons. You have the father giving himself completely in love to the son in, in total self-love. Remember, he just said in the gospel, the father has uh, given everything to me. And then the son giving himself completely back in love to the father. And the love between those two are so real, it constitutes another person, the Holy Spirit, the bond of their love. It harkens back to what St. Augustine had mentioned, how wherever there is love, there is three realities, right? There's the lover, the beloved, and the love that they share. Necessarily, wherever there's love, there's those three things. And that's the Holy Trinity, because God is love. And so that's when I hook back to what does that have to do with us? I asked, I asked a couple, what does it have to do with you two? Because we're made to, in the image and likeness of God, this tells us something about ourselves. And so I asked the wedding couple, what does this have to do with you two? You two who are made in the image of God are ordained in the sacrament of marriage to be an icon of this self-giving love between persons of the, of the, of the Trinity in your marriage. So that when they see your marital love for each other, the undying faithful love that you have for each other. They're reminded of God's self-giving love in the Trinity. 
It's no wonder then that marriage is the means by which God brings about new human life. Right, the love between man and woman, so real. Likewise, sometimes nine months later, you gotta give it, give it a name. It constitutes another person. So that Trinitarian dynamic there, all right, the fruit of their love, another person who will live forever. And so that's why it's, uh, it always needs to be in this context, this sacred covenant of marriage where father and mother have, have, have come given of themselves completely, unconditionally, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, for the sake, especially not only of themselves, but for their children. And so through this beautiful sacrament of marriage, you become co-creators with God. You know, unfortunately, our secular hookup culture has robbed the symbolism of that marital act so that, I mean, it doesn't have to entail any love at all now. Sometimes, you know, folks have this false impression that the church is, you know, is, is against sex and thinks it's dirty. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's exactly the opposite. The church reveres the marital act. It thinks it's so awesome, so beautiful, that it's sacred. It's of God. And he uses that very beautiful creation to be the means by which he creates children of his that will live forever with him. And so that's why the creation of man as an image of God was not complete until both Adam and Eve were created. Jesus reminds us, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Only when they've become one as male and female could they be fully the sacramental sign that's supposed to reflect and symbolize the eternal exchange of love that is the one triune God. That's the beautiful vocation of family life. Now, God wanted to make that real for us and bring us into that very life, that eternal exchange of love that's the triune God. To show and to show us, and how, how did he accomplish that? By becoming one of us. Because in Jesus, God the Son, the eternal word, takes on our humanity, enters into the, our dimension of space and time, takes on our humanity, and brings us up with him. And he shows us exactly what it means to love and what, to be human again because we've, we've become awfully inhuman to each other. And that's why he's the savior. He's the way, the truth, and the life that shows us how to love and how to be human again. And he married humanity to his divinity. That's why we call him Christ the bridegroom and the church his bride us, the human family. And in his ascension to heaven, he prepares a place for us in order to take us to himself, to enter into that eternal exchange of love that is God, the fulfillment of all desire. And unfortunately, at the, since the very beginning, there is one that wanted to destroy that plan, right? From the very beginning, symbolized in that serpent who tempted our first parents, Remember, the devil, the devil doesn't have his own clay, right? Fundamental principle, metaphysical principle. The des devil doesn't have his own clay. Everything God created is good. That was the lesson of, of creation. He looked upon it and said it was good. And th that beautiful line uh, in the last part of today's first reading of Proverbs, and he delighted, meaning the Son of God, delighted in the human race. You are his delight. But in order for love to be real and possible, a relationship of love, you got to give free will, right? If there's no free will, then we're just robots. But that's how being in, inhuman to each other, unfortunately, the, 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 down, the flip side of that is that we can be inhuman. We can now choose to be inhuman to each other and unloving. And that's what Christ has come to redeem, right? The evil one knows that uh, he just wants to destroy, right? That, that relationship of persons out of that jealousy 
of the angels, the fallen angels. He saw the destiny of humanity being raised up to the Godhead. And he said, I will not serve. And so Satan and his minions, his, his intent is, as, as the scripture says, to kill and to destroy. And, but all he can do in order to get us to fall is to distort or to twist the beautiful and good creation that God has made. This is what I mean by the devil doesn't have his own clay. He can't create evil beings. Everything God created is good. But in our free will, we can choose against God. And so that's what the evil one wants to tempt us to do. And that's what he's done with the beautiful plan for love and marriage and sexuality as a means by, the, the means God gave us to image his very life. Satan knows that if he can distort that fundamental union God had ordained in marriage, if he can destroy the institution of marriage and the family, he can destroy humanity. And we see a lot of that now, right, as the world buys more and more into the father of lies. But once again, God cannot be outdone. The good work he's begun in humanity, he will bring to completion for those that desire it that answer that invitation, that marriage proposal that he gives to every human being on earth. But God, because God can't be outdone. See, goodness is diffusive of itself, right? It desi always desires to give of itself, to communicate itself. It's, it's said that all of creation, in fact, is an overflow of that love, that eternal exchange of love that is the Holy Trinity. All of creation is an overflow of that magnanimous love. That that is the principal cause of the Big Bang, right? And even to, to this day, we know the universe keeps expanding. That is a result of love. And because God is inexhaustible, his goodness and love is everlasting. It will never be exhausted. It will never be extinguished. It will never be consumed. It, in fact, swallows up the evil in the world, right? Which is what Jesus did on the cross. On that cross, he absorbs, he consumes all that the evil in the world, all that evil can throw at him. He absorbs and consumes because his love is so much more powerful. Evil cannot withstand the inexhaustible love of the Trinity, revealed in God the Son, poured out to us in the Holy Spirit. More powerful, right? I can't go uh, conclude this homily without in mentioning the, the terrible tragedy that happened just last Sunday in Nigeria. 50 of our African brothers and sisters slaughtered in a church celebrating Mass. Maybe you've heard about it. Maybe you haven't, because it was sorely underreported. And a gunman down, I mean, the, the, the images from inside that church at, in the aftermath, horrific, pools of blood everywhere. But even in the face of such horror, we have hope as a Christian people because we know that that's not the end. Even with those martyrs, especially those martyrs who have a straight ticket to heaven, right, and the witness of their faith, they are fulfilling their very purpose in life, achieving the end for which they were made, which is a share, a participation in that eternal exchange of love that is the triune God. More powerful than all the passing tragedies in our world, this eternal exchange of love that is the most holy trinity.